Hello. Welcome to Dare to Dream. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. If you are interested in any of their classes, workshops, online products, books, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com, as well as accessconsciousness.com. Dare to Dream has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards, as well as a Webby Award. And we are ranked consistently in the top best podcasts in self improvement in all of Apple Podcasts. My question to you is, what would you do to understand more about what goes on in the stage, specifically musical theater? My guest today is Steve Cuden, who created the hit Broadway and international musical, Jekyll and Hyde, writing the show's original book and lyrics with noted composer Frank Wildhorn. Steve has written 90 teleplays for popular animated TV series such as X-Men, The Batman, Iron Man, Pink Panther. Oh, this is a word that Steve will have to say, but I'm going to go on to the next. Gargoyles and numerous others. Steve directed and co-produced the cult favorite horror comedy feature, Lucky. He's the author of two books on writing, Beating Broadway, one of which we will be discussing today, and Beating Hollywood, which if you want to go back in the archives, he was on the show four years ago discussing. He taught screenwriting for 10 years in the Conservatory of Performing Arts at Point Park University in Pittsburgh. And Steve currently produces and hosts a podcast weekly called Story Beat with Steve Cuden. These are in-depth interviews exploring the creative process of artists of all kinds. To learn more about Steve, go to stevecuden.com and storybeat.net. And with that, I welcome Steve to the Dare to Dream show. Oh, so hi, you. Debbie. Great to be here. And and for everyone, um, Debbie will be on the show shortly on, on uh, Story Beat uh, in the next few weeks, in fact. Yes, absolutely. And I have to say, I'm still buzzing from our interview together because having done a considerable amount of these interviews over the last 12 years, yours is a standout. You're really a great interviewer. Oh, aren't you kind? Aren't you kind? You know, it's a great place to start because you have this ability in some of what you're doing today. Besides the podcast, what is it about speaking to people, celebrities, artists, creatives, what is it that really juices you up and gets you in that conversation? Oh, it's um, my entire life. I have been very interested in the process of creativity. How does one take inspiration or desire and turn it into a product of some kind? Because at the end of the day, it's all about some production, whether you're producing a book or you're producing a play or whether you're producing a movie, it's all about producing something or a piece of art, anything like that. I've always been keenly interested in not so much, well, I love the outcomes, but I'm also keenly interested in how you get to that outcome. What is that process like? And that's what StoryBeat focuses on is how people develop whatever it is they're trying to bring into the world. And how does it get from some notion in your head to a finished piece that many people hopefully can enjoy? Mm. That's really what it's all about for me. I love that. Yeah, the whole idea that there's a product inherent in it. And so you're finding out what systemically has just happened that created that end result. I want to know what created you as an end result, because you spent a lifetime on musicals, writing, observing, being a part of getting something on Broadway that's got one of the longest runs and not easy to do. Did you yourself attend musicals growing up? Was there a theater influence for young Stevie? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah somewhat. I the very first musicals, the fir first musical I remember knowing about was at a summer camp that I went to called Camp Kiwani. And those that went to Kiwani will know all what I'm talking about. I was in a production at Camp Kiwani. I was all of eight or nine years old uh, of Guys and Dolls. With at a summer camp, you know, with all boys, no girls, there were no girls there. And um, I was 
it, it was it turned me on greatly to be able to be on stage. That wasn't really what triggered everything for me, but that was the beginning of it was, hey, this is kind of neat. There's lights and there's people out there. And by the way, if you say the lines right and it gets laughs, oh, that just, just your whole body just goes into a kind of atomic reverie. And so uh, I, it got into my veins pretty early. I didn't really get going in the theater till I was around 14, 15 years old when I got involved in a children's theater company um, here in Pittsburgh, which is my hometown, though I spent many years not here. Um, uh, I got involved in the children's theater company and was in, was doing everything. I did lighting and sets and costumes and uh, was were in the shows. I helped to write some of the shows. And that, um, in my last couple of years of high school, was really what got into the veins. That was... I, I was lost at that point in the world of theater and, and um, entertainment and drama and comedy. That's really where it happened. You and I both went to USC, Steve, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you were a performer there, but you also did electrical lighting design. And so with that background, how did you take that and suddenly learn how to write a musical? Well, um, there was no training for me in writing musicals. Uh, everything that I know about writing musicals came from just doing it uh, and from observing, obviously, but it didn't come from a book, didn't come from a class. Um, I have had a more than eclectic uh, history with theater. So I've done all these different, played all these different roles in the world of theater. Again, I've been a lighting designer. I've worked on building sets and acting on stage and, and so on. Um, and the musicals have always been really fascinating to me because there's, uh, for me personally, and for, I think for many people, there's something about that razzle dazzle that happens, uh, once the lights go down, the, the orchestra starts playing and people start singing and dancing with all kinds of lighting, uh, cause musicals tend to have heavy lights in them. And, um, there's just something about it that's just pizzazz to me and, uh, it felt like it's a bubble in me that I've always wanted to be involved in. And to this day, I'm still involved in working on them. I'm working on a couple of musicals right now. I can't tell you too much about them because they're, they're in the works, but, uh, there's something about musicals. Musicals, by the way, are more closely aligned to how they're built to movies than they are to plays. What do you they're mean the, by that? So structurally, musicals tend to be structured more like feature films are structured than like some plays are structured. So for instance, um, most plays, not most, many plays, uh, and I'll give you a good example in a moment, many plays um, don't ever um, move forward. They just keep rising in some way or what we would call going vertical. So the play Waiting for Gatto is a really good example it never really goes anywhere. You learn a whole lot of very interesting oddball things in Waiting for Gatto. And it, it the world is in that play. It's my favorite play of all plays. Mm -hmm. And the world is in there. The philosophy of life and the world, it's all in there. But the play never moves forward. They're stuck waiting for Gatto. Mm -hmm. You could never, I shouldn't say never, but it would be very challenging to write that as a musical because musicals want to move forward like a shark. Sharks must move forward or they die. And movies must move forward or they die. You can't just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk in a movie. Most people will turn it off. Um, there are exceptions to that as there are exceptions to everything in art. So good ex example would be My Dinner with Andre, which is two guys talking for 80 minutes or something like that. Um, but that's really rare. Most movies have to proceed forward. And musicals are like, are like movies in the sense that they must move forward or they die on the vine. So um, in that sense, I find that that relationship between something that I dearly love, motion pictures, and something else that I dearly love, which is the theater and musicals, that it's really sort of the same thing with many different elements in it. Interesting. And you alluded to the fact you've got some projects, so you're writing right now. Mm -hmm. I am. 
How do you pick your subjects? Like from inception of your first musical, which is many decades ago to now, what happens that inspires you? I have to research and take on this subject and this is gonna be my project because these projects are not short-lived. They are really long once you dive into something like this. Yeah, the average today anyway, the average length of time it takes from inception of a musical to getting to Broadway, if it's ever going to get there, and most don't, but if it's ever going to get there, the average length is somewhere between seven and 12 years. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time to get there. It takes a long time just to write it. It takes a long time to get it, you know, money and backers and uh, rehearsals and et cetera, et cetera. Um, the answer to your question is, I'm not sure I know the answer. It's a gut feeling that sometimes there's uh, something that just piques your interest and you go, that's kind of interesting. Um, let's explore that. I, I, I can use it, Jekyll and Hyde as a good example of how that happened. Um, so by the time that Frank Wildhorn and I uh, started working on Jekyll and Hyde, which was in 1980, so that's 41 years ago that we, I was sitting in, a, in his one bedroom apartment in Westwood, California, mm -hmm. and we had already written two shows that will never see the light of day mm. one called the high and mighty caesar based on the life of julius caesar go ahead and turn that into a musical or oh, and the next one was called the last czar which was about the last czar and czarina of russia the the, the romanovs and go ahead and turn that into a musical you know that they're just not going to get very far unless there's something really spectacular you do with it and we were sitting around after writing those two saying well what are we going to do next and we didn't know, but we're, you're always looking for inspiration from somewhere. And I believe in the notion that we as artists are conduits from wherever, God, the heavens, the universe, energy, whatever you want to call it. I believe that we as artists are not actually the instigators of the art. We are the conduit mm. for it. And so it's coming through you to the world somehow. And we were sitting around in his apartment and we're thinking, what are we going to do next? Well, Frank and I were extremely inspired at that time. This is 1980. On a, for, uh, um, we were inspired by a show that was relatively new. It had only been out for a year or a year and a half called Sweeney Todd. Mm -hmm. That was a Stephen Sondheim show. And to this day, that's my favorite musical. I think that's one of the greatest pieces of anything that's ever been Great. written. And uh, we thought to ourselves, well, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And we thought we would flatter Mr. Sondheim by doing something that was gothic and horror, because that was, that was like cool to both of us. And we started looking at different shows, uh, you know, concepts to work on. And it's always lovely if you can find something that something that's in the public domain, because then you don't have to pay anybody for rights to it. Mm -hmm. And so we were looking at public domain horror stories. Where do you look for something like that? Well, you can always determine that through today. It's relatively easy because you can go to the Library of Congress dot L-O-C. I think it's dot L-O-C dot gov or something like that um, and search for whether you search for a, a title to see whether there's a copyright on it or not. Mm -hmm. If you have a book, pretty much any book you have, unless it was published before the 1900s, uh, it will have a copyright bug in it in, in the you know first, second, third page, somewhere in there. Um, so we started looking at horror stories. We, we thought about uh, musicalizing Frankenstein and Dracula and the Wolfman and we were looking at um, we were looking at a little thing called the Phantom of the Opera about seven years before before Lloyd Webber oh my God. wrote his version. We were actually considering doing Phantom of the Opera. Well, that'll never work. You know, that's what you're sitting around the room. That'll that won't work. So you know, best laid plans of mice and men. Um, and so I then said, well, what about Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde? And Frank said to me, well, what? what's that? And I said, well, it's, I think there's an interesting potential there because you've got one man who is actually two, who has a, a good female and a bad female from one from the, from the upper end of the tracks and one from the lower end of the tracks. 
And he said, yeah, that's really good because you could do a, a, tr a love triangle, a romantic mm -hmm. love triangle of, of sorts. And so um, I went and got the book and read it. And most people I've discovered over time think they know the book of the strange case. The full title of it is The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Most people think they've read it at some point in their life. Most people think they've, they know it. And the truth is very few people actually know the book. They may have read it, but most people have not. It's really short. It's only about 100 pages. It's really a novella. There are no women in it. There's no love story in it. There's no romance of any kind. There's a mention of a little girl on one page, and there's a mention of a maid on another page. There are no, there are no women. It's in three sections, two diary entries and one sort of a, a, a memory, memory retelling of what happened between three different characters, one being uh, John Utterson, uh, one being Hasty Lanyon, and the other being Jekyll. And uh, there's no ending. He disappears. So we had to concoct a story, whole cloth, out of the simple notion that the polarity and duality of man, that within all of us, we're one fine line away from being crazy, mad, um, murderous, that you know, you, we've seen over the course of history, many people have committed murder of one kind or another in a rage that they would otherwise never have done. And they wind up paying a penalty for that. But uh, Jekyll and Hyde is, a, is and, and um, Stevenson writes about it, that it is about the polarity that's within all of us and that we are constantly as humans fighting that polarity. We, you know, there's, everybody has a little devil in them. And everybody wants to do something a little devilish in their life. And sometimes it comes out when you're much younger. And sometimes it comes out when you're much older. But uh, it's we as humans are always suppressing the evil part of we as humans, that we have that duality. And that then becomes universal. Everybody understands that. And so that's, what, that's how we got to start on Jekyll and Hyde, the musical. And how, how do you musicalize that? Well, you got to come up with a story that makes sense. Yeah. So I just want to, you know, refer back to your book. So for sure. people who are enjoying this conversation, now, if you're not watching us and you're listening to the podcast, it will be in the show notes so you can get this book. And it's also being announced at the beginning as well as at the end. But this is Beating Broadway, How to Create Stories for Musicals That Get Standing Ovations. This is written by Steve Cuden. So if you're interested in the genre this is an amazing book oh, and there's tremendous also i love examples they're very helpful so you start to understand the pattern of what you're talking about so before steve you alluded to the fact that you and frank were throwing around some ideas some of which never saw the light of day what are <laughs> the actual statistics for a musical to see the light of day to make it to stage and get a paid audience. Well, okay, just to, to this to stage, as in there's a production of it somewhere, whether it's at your local uh, community center or whether it's in a local school or whether it winds up being on the on the road or or all the way to Broadway or a or a, a local repertory theater or something like that. Um, there are I, I don't know the actual numbers, but I'll give you a couple of clues. Um, let's just say it's close to impossible and to have a show get to Broadway and hit is like hitting the lottery. So there are in the whole long history of Broadway, which is over a hundred years, it's 110 or 20 years at this point. Um, in the whole long history of Broadway, there are only about 80 to 90 shows somewhere in there that have gotten to what they call long run status. A long run status means you've played for 800 performances minimum. Well, there are, there are only eight performances a week possible. Um, so there's seven days in the week. They don't perform on Monday. So you're doing two matinees a week. So that's six days plus two matinees, right? So that's eight shows a week times 52 is 416 shows possible a year. So to get to 800 performances is a little less than two years. So for a show to run that long is really challenging. And um, for a show to go from inception 
to production, I think that those odds are already really long, though they're not as long as getting to Broadway, obviously. Um, the, you know, it's, it's the conceptualization, it's the figuring out what the story is, it is the saying, okay, who are the characters in this thing? Do we need to uh, write this in some meaningful way? Like you write the libretto first, you write the play, and then do you uh, come in and figure out where the songs belong? And then do you start to write the music? Or do you just sit down and just start knocking it out? There's a million ways to go at it. But the truth is, once you start down that road, it's usually many months of development to get to um, uh, where you have music attached to uh, a book, what you call the book, unless it's an operetta or some form of totally sung through opera like Les Mis or Tom, Who's Tommy, um, which are sung through. Um, most shows have some kind of dialogue in them. Uh, they don't have to, obviously. And there are very few musicals that don't have at least 15 to 17 songs minimum. Some have many more than that. It just depends on what the material calls for. N there, there are no two shows that are the same. There is, I like to say in the book, which I think is really important for people to understand, there is a form that we all as writers follow. Whether, whether we're informed of the form or not, we follow it. There is no formula. And the difference between a form and a formula, which is what throws people off sometimes, is that the form says, here's the way the pattern of understanding happens. So we, as, we in the West, we communicate with each other by telling each other stories. What happened to you today? Oh, well, this happened, this happened, and that happened, and this happened, and you tell that story. When you turn on the news, what do they tell you? Tonight's top story is, it's all about storytelling. And there is a form to the way that we communicate with each other that we learn as children and we don't even think about it, we do it naturally. There is a beginning, middle, and end to a story. If you started the story at the end, and then told the middle, and then told the beginning, nobody would understand what you were talking about. So there is a form to the way that musicals exist in a, in, so that audiences understand the storytelling. Because a musical, by the way, is not really a musical, in my opinion, unless you're telling a story. There might, if, if, you're, if you just have a bunch of songs that you're playing, that's called a concert. That's not a musical. A musical has characters, it has a story, it has character arc, it has a beginning, middle, and end, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a formula is, and this is a good way to think about formula, you now have your show. You have Jekyll and Hyde the musical, and it's succeeded on Broadway, and somebody comes along and says, hey, we want to take it out on the road and put it into a lot of theaters across America one week at a time, and we want to put it into the West End of London, and we want to have it play in uh, the Asian, Asian countries, and we want it to be everywhere at the same time. Those productions are beholden to what that standard was on Broadway, and that then is a formula. Mm. So the formula becomes it's a repetition of things. So, but the form can be a, is malleable and adaptable to pretty much any and every story. And once you understand that form, it's a lot easier to construct a story. Yeah. I, you know, I grew up on Long Island in New York and what we did as a family, my mother, who was a music teacher, would take me into New York City, into Manhattan, and we would go to plays. I was really cultured as a little, little girl. I went to opera. I went to ballet. I went to drama. I saw lots of musicals and I was obsessed with musicals as a child. What was your first? Wow. Um, Not trying to stump the host today. But. No, at all. <laughs> and, and you know, I'd have to, I, I, I'm so cute. I saved playbills. That's how I, much have, I have every playbill I've ever seen. Right. Oh my God. And I remember, you know, standing at the back door for the actors to come out. Like it was everything to me. I remember, and this was completely not my uh, first play, but I do remember seeing the Me Nobody Knows. Mm. I remember seeing Runaways. 
uh, like everything and anything that was there, Pippin, whatever, my mom would just take me into the city and that was our day. And then we'd go out for a meal and then drive back to Long Island. But I loved this. And I, this feeling you're talking about, I'm so intimate with when the lights go halfway down and the orchestra starts to play the overture and it's like, oh, I'm cavelling. <laughs> this Yiddish well, word. Well, for we're for, overjoyed. We are having this conversation during COVID and there are no shows anywhere. And we're all missing that communal experience. It's one thing to sit at home and watch Hamilton on Disney Plus by yourself, which is how I watched it. Which I did uh, too, twice. Right. And, and But there's something about um, that nice. crowd. Yeah. There's just something... And by the way, one of the fascinating things about, because when I talk to lots of actors on uh, Storybeat, um, one of the fascinating things that they talk about that I think is tr truly telling, you know, when you're in a show, and you know this, when you're in a show repetitively, and by the way, that's a form of formula where you're doing the show over and over again. Um, when you're in a show, every audience makes the show different that night by their reactions and how the chemistry between the performers and the chemistry between the performers and the audience, it's different every performance. Mm -hmm. But the audience, who more than likely is only going to see it once, that's their total memory. Yeah. They don't see all these differences. They don't see the, the, the very fine differences between one performance after another. You, the performer, feel those differences. But with that, imagine if somebody said to you, um, you were going to be a theater actor for the rest of your life, and you were going to do shows for the rest of your life, and there was never going to be an audience there. Oh, <laughs> you, You'd say, forget it. Yeah, you lost me on that last one. Right, exactly. So the audience, by the way, Aristotle, wise that he was 2,700 years ago, said you need a, a messenger, a, a message, a messenger, and a receiver. So, so you need to have the story, the person writing the story, and you need an audience. And without those three, you don't have a complete circuit. So you have to have the audience. And so give us, I, so I'm so curious because you've talked about storytelling several times mm -hmm. and I know your book goes into length. What are some fundamentals for really great storytelling? And I have to say, you know, a few of my questions also they go into the realm that I am, I have a few careers, most of them are all around visibility. It's actually just one platform, but it's around visibility, writing a book, getting the book to international bestseller and being interviewed. That's what I coach and that's what I do out in the world. So for people who are authors and for people who wanna write musicals or plays, or maybe they're speaking on stage, what are some of the elements, the fundamentals of great storytelling? Well, the biggest one, and what is a challenge for both you and me in doing a podcast like the ones we do, mm. is that the singular thing, I have lots of consultant clients on, you know, various, on screenplays and on musicals. Um, the thing that's missing in most uh, stories that succeed or it's, it's not missing in those stories, it's missing from those people trying to make it succeed, is conflict. And you and I do shows here that have little to no conflict in them. So it then becomes a challenge to have people become interested in them. Because if you think about what's really fascinating to people, most people are looking in their entertainment world to get outside of themselves. Their mundane or difficult or challenging or troubled lives, whatever it would be, they want a little respite from it. So they get they go to, to a movie or they watch a TV show or they read a book or whatever that would be. And what they're looking for, most people are looking for, is a character, usually a protagonist, in search of a goal and that there is nothing but conflict in the way. And if you have that in your story where it's nonstop conflict from beginning to end, the audience will love you. They will love you because if you resolve that conf conflicted search for a resolution to a goal, if you resolve that, 
in a satisfying way. And that's a key word, satisfying. If what you are coming, whatever res resolution you get to at the end of your story, if it's satisfying, you will become all kinds of rich. Um, you will make more money than you know what to do with. And uh, that those are the, the key underpinnings of all great um, successful, memorable, popular stories is that there is a character in search of a goal with obstacles and conflict in the way that reaches an ultimate resolution, whether happy or unhappy, because there are lots of really successful stories that do not end happily. That whole myth about the Hollywood happy ending, it's true in a lot of Hollywood movies, but there's a lot of, there are a lot of successful Hollywood movies that are not happy endings at all. Two good examples, Chinatown, not a happy ending. The Godfather, not a happy ending. So you can find all these really, you know, r difficult ends, but highly successful. Why? Because the ending is satisfying to the audience. And those are the elements that aren't there. Now, the other thing we have already alluded to it is structure. If you structure your story in a poor way, structure is everything. It's the foundation and the the, the structure of the house that you're building your story on, if that's not there, it will fall apart. Foundation. Found you, there is a foundation to storytelling and then a structure to the building of it. Mm. Uh, storytelling screenplays uh, frequently are said are akin to architecture. Mm -hmm. There's an architecture to the way you build a, a, a successful story. And without that architecture, it will fall apart with rare exceptions. There are, as I say, exceptions to every one of these rules. But now, Steve, when you do that, when you create the foundation and then the mm -hmm. architecture for your story, do you roadmap it? So yeah. in advance, do you sit down and just sort of bullet point, well, this has to happen, this has to happen, this has to happen in order to get us here? Or is it just something you allow yourself to flow with and see where it takes? So there, I, there, I like to say the number one rule of storytelling is there are no rules. Hmm. Cool. Okay. So yeah. there's no, there's no one right way to do any of this. It's how you are able to best do it. And if it works for you that way, it works for you that way. In my specific case, I'm an outliner. I need to outline. I need to know where I'm going. As you say, a roadmap, I need to know that, or I then am uncertain of what I'm doing. Some people like to just go. They just, okay, I've got a notion, I've got a character, and I'm just going to start putting them into some kind of jeopardy or trouble or make it difficult for them. And I'm just going to see what turns out. There are novelists that work that way, where there's no outline. And I would say a significant number of novelists and uh, screenwriters and playwrights and so on do outline. And then the outline becomes a guide. It's not, it's not concrete. And in fact, the, so there are two different major artistic parts of storytelling. One is an art form and the other is a craft. And you need to be a master of both, both the art form and the craft in order to be successful. And the craft is something that I can teach you pretty quickly. Craft is relatively easy to learn, though not particularly easy to master. It's easy to understand and it's easy to, to learn, but not particularly easy to master. The art form is very challenging and some people are naturally gifted at it and some are not. And um, it, it, it really does require you uh, saying to yourself, okay, I've, the, in my case, the, the, the part of the craft is developing an outline. And so then I'm, I feel like I've mastered what it is I'm attempting to do. I know where my beginning, middle, and end is. And every story has a beginning, middle, and end. I don't care what anybody else says. Uh, and then how do I get from the beginning of the story to the end of the story? Which, by the way, are really tricky because most people don't realize that it's easy to say, it's so simple to say, yes, every story has a beginning, middle, and end. But okay, where do you start? Well, I'll go back to Aristotle for a moment. He more or less, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he more or less said, you don't want to start your story before it begins. And you don't want to end your story after it ends. I mean, he says that in a simplistic way, but there's truth to that. Where do you start and how do you end? And those two are so important to the success of a story, the where and where beginning and end, 
And then what do you proceed to do in between those two, two points? Because you, you and everybody listening to this has seen more than one movie or TV show that kind of like the beginning of it, it was grinding on and on. And you, where's the story? It hasn't started yet. Well, they, they started too late. Oh, interesting. And you've also seen stories that went on and on at the end after the climax mm -hmm. and was like, well, get over yourselves. We're done. And they've gone on too long. Yes. So that's part of it too. Um, and so this, it's the same this is for like you and I, we're so on the same page because um, you're talking about the elements that I teach my writing students. Good. And right on. Yes. Yeah, so important. This is Joseph Campbell's hero's journey essentially. And, it, you know, sometimes it's really interesting. I can think of one example, one student amongst many is a great example who extremely upbeat, extremely powerful and positive. And when I read the writing, I don't even want to allude to the gender of the person, but when I read the writing, I'm like, mm -hmm. where's the conflict? because there's a lot of glory here and how you create what you create. That's awesome. But as a reader, there's nothing inherently here for me. You've uh, got to take me on a ride. And anytime you go from point A to point Z, right? And over mm -hmm. the hill there, it's going to be ee, 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 like, you know, two steps forward and five obstacles back and two steps forward. I mean, Conflict is everything. I'm going to give your, your listeners a really good clue on something. Great. You want to, this is going to sound worse than it is. Mm -hmm. You want to have absolutely no mercy for your protagonist. No mercy. I tell my students this regularly. When you start your story, you want to think about your story that you have your protagonist under tremendous pressure. Mm -hmm. where you're actually squashing them down. They're on the ground and you've got them squashed underneath something and you're squashing them. And as the story progresses, you want to press down harder and harder and harder and harder so that it gets more and more difficult. By the way, that's akin to what's known as rising action. That as the story progresses, it gets more intense and more uh, conflicted and more difficult, more challenging. Um, and when you continue to apply pressure, character under pressure, when you do that, for an entire story, what will happen is the audience will be breathless and they will absolutely adore you. Yeah. And so success comes from that pressure. So when you tell me that you know a writer who's writing the happy stuff or the glory stuff or the successful stuff, people aren't interested in that because they're trying to get away from that. They're trying to find that in their own lives. Right. They're usually not having it in their own lives. And so they escape into the movies to see someone else survive challenges and difficulties. And they will reach, here's, here's a, another great clue. For me, the singular reason why we go to movies, read, read books, watch TV shows, their singular reason is to achieve this lovely little thing from the Greeks called catharsis. Mm -hmm. that, it, that to me, I call that the storytelling drug. Mm -hmm. That is what we're addicted to. We come back. We'll watch a movie repeatedly because we will get to that cathartic moment at the end. It's a Wonderful Life. I watch once a year at Christmas time. You get to the very end. George Bailey, you're the richest man in town. And I just start the ball and it's catharsis. Mm -hmm. It's and that catharsis, which is a, an emotional purging. And so if you've ever been to a movie and you walked out of the theater feeling like you were on a cloud, like it was lighter than air, like, oh, wow, I'm so relieved. It's so wonderful. I'm going to tell all my friends and family about this. That's catharsis. Yeah. If you can achieve catharsis, you can become very wealthy. Mm, yeah. Catharsis is a major key, a major key. Because if you don't achieve catharsis, then you're not going to get to that word I used earlier, satisfaction. Satisfaction comes from catharsis. Catharsis. And so we've right. got hashtag great storytelling and hashtag big idea. Because another like really important thing that you said was you have to capture people in the beginning. This ca cannot meander because it, whether it's the beginning of a book or a movie or a musical, we've got to grab people right from the get go. And At of the course, top. so many techniques to do that. Um, so Steve, so here you were a BA at USC. Yes. Later you go to UCLA 
professional well, a, program a, in screenwriting. A lot, a lot later. A lot later. <laughs> 30 <then> years later. <laughs> still trajectory right then you get an mfa in screenwriting from ucla mm -hmm. hats off to you and so after school all of that's done you have all your certificates how did you branch out into tv screenwriting what was that big break that happened oh i oh i had the 30 years worth of tv screenwriting before i went back to school interesting so, so why so, even back to school well because okay that's a great question and and by the way there are any number of people that have the same experience that I'm about to explain. Um, in Hollywood, in particular, there is this little thing that happens as you age, you start to become less desirable by certain less relevant. Yes. Yeah, I don't know about relevant. It's just that. There... So people will talk about ageism in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And I was trained and do believe that there isn't there is a degree of it, but there's much less ageism than there is pyramidism. So what does that mean? As you get into the business as a young person, and you better get in young as a writer because you are eventually going to become less, as you said, relevant. Um, if you get in at a young age, you start to meet people who are your contemporaries. And as your contemporaries start to rise in the business and you start to rise in the business, you are sort of equals. But as you rise up that chain, up that pyramid, because you're going toward a, a, a peak, not, it's not flat. Uh, it's a, you start to rise in importance and whether you're paid more and whether you're expected to do more and whether you're supposed to deliver a different thing and you, you, get, you become a different person as you do more. And as that happens, not to everybody, but to a fairly significant number of people, their friends that have been, you and your friends are sort of helping one another along as you rise up this pyramid, they start to flake away or they, things happen, they get families and they decide they don't want to work as hard or they, um, they get sick or they just they're sick of the business or whatever it is and they flake away and as they flake away you lose some of that contemporary uh juju i guess it would be where you're on that same level with someone and suddenly the people who are now in charge of the shows are 15 20 years younger than you and they want to help their contemporaries so you are unable to get as much work that's what happens it goes up this pyramid and I started to experience some of that where I was making, uh, I was working on less and less material every year that was for pay. And I started looking around for something to do with my life because I'm not a sit, sit around person. And I thought, I wonder if I would be any good as a teacher. And I thought I would be a good teacher, but I didn't know whether I could teach because I'd never taught. And I decided, well, all right. Um, I'm going to see if I can go back to school and get an MFA because I wanted, I didn't want to teach at the high school level. I wanted to teach at a college level or higher. And um, the, it's almost impossible to get a, a decent teaching job at a college anywhere, unless you have a, what they call a terminal degree. That's an MFA or a, or a PhD. So I went back to UCLA. I was delighted that they had accepted me. Um, I'd already written 90 teleplays. Jekyll and Hyde was already a massive worldwide hit when I went back to school and um, got the MFA in order to be eligible to, to get a good job at some university. And within six months of my graduating in 2010, um, a job came available here at Point Park University in Pittsburgh, which is, just happens to be my hometown. I applied for the job and, and the fools hired me. So uh, uh, you know, then I came back and I've taught for 10 years here and recently have stepped down from uh, full-time teaching in order to get back to creativity, but I'm still teaching on the side. So um, it turns out, and I'm, you know, I'm not one to really tout myself that highly, but I'm a pretty good teacher, I think. And I think the proof, the proof of it is when you see students come into a school as, as a freshman and know very little, and four years later when they graduate, they know a whole lot. And you know that it's their work, their hard work and dedication, but also you have contributed to that by teaching them things. Mm. You're also a story and script consultant, which yes, yes. I love knowing, by the way, because um, I don't know if you find this, but people will come to me knowing what I do and then assume, well, because Debbie teaches books, clearly 
you must teach screenwriting. <laughs> it's a different <laughs> animal. And I, oh, oh, very I, different, I, different animal. Very, very different. different. Absolutely. I've researched the heck out of it, but you know, it's not my expertise. So great. Now I have a colleague to send people to, but how does that work? Does somebody bring you a finished script and you help them tweak it? Or do they come to you with just, I've got this idea. I don't know how to flesh it out. I need to hire a mentor or it, both. There, it, it's it's sort of all of the above, but with a big caveat on it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's less helpful to people if they come to me with their their notion, their idea, their concept, their outline. Though I've looked at those two, and say, "Can you help me to make this better?" And the answer is yes, but it's it's expensive for them. Uh, it's time consuming. And it's usually less uh, helpful for me to look at the unfinished work. It's much more uh, efficient for me to uh, receive a completed script mm -hmm. that they go, I don't, there's something wrong. I don't know what it is. I'm getting bad feedback from people. I've had mm -hmm. friends or family or, or professionals read it and reject it. And, uh, and what am I doing wrong? I will tell you 90% of the time, it has to do with the lack of conflict, like we've already talked about 90% of the time. But then there are lots of other elements along the way. One of the challenging things about being a consultant is that it, it, you, if you're not a longtime professional and you have been rejected many times, or you have been rewritten many times, or you have received copious notes from others, um, it's sometimes challenging for newer writers to accept notes. So I'm going to give you a clue to the best way to accept notes, which I think is re really a valuable thing to teach people. And that is when you are in a note taking session or somebody's giving you notes, it's the smart thing to do is to listen carefully. That's a key word. Listen carefully to or read every note that you're given and to consider every note that you're given because every note means somebody took exception or saw something in inadequate or in need of help or it's not quite right. Every note has validity, whether you, the writer who now has their baby, you've, you've got their baby in your hands and please don't hurt the baby. And please don't tell me I'm not a good writer. And please tell me this is the most wonderful thing you've don't ever read. Don't criticize the baby. And don't criticize the baby. And the truth of the matter is you've come to me for a reason, mm -hmm. which is something's not right. You're, you're, you have no confidence about something and I'm giving you my expertise and feedback. Mm -hmm. Does that make me um, the end all and be all? Absolutely not. Does it make me um, the answer to your prayers? Probably not though, maybe. Um, I'm going to give you my best feedback on what I see and and say to you give it another you know another draft usually it's not one more draft it's usually numerous drafts um i will tell you the uh, i spoke a short while ago about art and craft the craft of screenwriting to me or script writing is writing R write the first draft figure out how to knock out this first draft mm -hmm. and that's that's already a really high bar to get over but the, the art of storytelling, screenwriting, book writing, the art is in rewriting. Yep. And all great writers will tell you that writing is rewriting. And you can, if you start to study up on the great writers of all time, they will all tell you the same thing. There are occasionally you'll bump into someone who's inordinately fantastic and successful who writes so slowly and considers each sentence so much that by the time they're done, they never rewrite. Oh. That's really rare. William Styron wrote that way. He never rewrote. He took just enormous amounts of time to write each sentence. Wow. Right. So that's not how I work. I'm, I'm a believer in, in what are known as, as uh, purge drafts or puke drafts. I'm a flow. believer in flow. I, I believe get it out. Yeah. I'll give you, I'll, I'll tell you how I look at it. I think of, so everybody, mo most everybody can relate to the notion of 
in school, when you're a kid, you go to an art class and the teacher gives you this big misshapen lump of clay to make a sculpture, or they give you a, you know, a, 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 a rectangle with a worth of clay and you make uh, a sculpture out of it. So you've got this nothing, you've got a lump and you turn it into something that looks like something or it's a cup or an ashtray or whatever you turn it into. As a writer, you don't even have the clay. So your first draft from my perspective is you are now manufacturing the clay, the misshapen, lumpy, ugly, you don't know what it is, clay, that's your first draft. And then all the other drafts after it, and I'm a, I'm a revision draft junkie, I do revision and re lots of revisions. Um, all those revisions are taking that clay that you've made and shaping it into a something that you believe is a fine thing. And um, that is, for me, that's a way to get past the challenge of the first draft, which I, I don't like first drafts. I, uh, it's painful to me. First drafts are challenging and they're hard and they never come out for me. They never come out right. And it's like, oh God, what am I doing now? So I have to go back and start to be an artist. And the art, the art form of it is shaping that clay so that it becomes a fine um, work of art. Mm. You and I are so on the same page. Thank you. I really appreciate what you're sharing. And for folks who are not familiar or are already doing this, and are looking for more depth, more direction and guidance, you are definitely receiving some great, great tips here today. Um, so you can listen and re-listen. Uh, something I'm fascinated about, Steve, is the fact that somehow you've parlayed your teaching, being a professor and writing your books and your musicals and your screenplays, et cetera. And then you've also moderated Q and A's at Carnegie Music Hall. How did you come into that awesome, I would love to do that, auspicious job to be sitting in front of these great artists and celebrities and asking them questions in front of an audience? Well, you're talking about Car Carnegie Music Hall here in Pittsburgh, not That's in correct. New York. <laughs> That's correct. Right. I've yet to be on the stage at Carnegie Hall. You know, How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Um, uh, the, the answer is uh, by doing a podcast. Ah, really? Yeah, because, well, I do, you do an interview show, I do an interview show. But how did you pitch your hat for that? They came to me. Hmm. I didn't pitch anything. Okay, well, good. <laughs> I hope they hear me on your show somewhere here on the West Coast and someone thinks of me because I would so, love so, it. So, you know, and I haven't, truthfully, the, the honest truth of it is I haven't really explored how to go about becoming on a circuit. There are people that, that are on a circuit where they both give seminars and they give talks. I've given many seminars and talks here in Pittsburgh. I was at the, uh, the first pr producer's perspective. Um, uh, I guess it was called the super, super conference or whatever it was called in New York uh, three, four years ago and gave a seminar on, on storytelling for musicals. Um, and so there, there are, uh, circuits for that. And there are folks that are agents in that and there are bureaus that handle those sorts of things. I've never really explored those, but they exist. And you could easily um, start to look for that if that's what you want to do. If you want to go on the road, well, it's pretty hard to do right now with COVID. But uh, when that when we get past this, um, it might be a lot of fun to to travel. And so you get asked to go here, there and, and, and elsewise. The, the, the thing about being an interviewer is if you can um, make yourself known in that world, then you're the person. Here's the way I think about interviewing in, that, in those circumstances. It's not about you at all. It's about whoever the subject is. And so uh, I had the great good fortune to in my very first interview ever was at Point Park, but was with the spectacular um, very generous, wonderful human being who everyone knows, Brian Cranston. Mm. So from Breaking Bad and, and many other things, yeah. uh, Malcolm in the Middle and many other things. Um, he came in and I interviewed him for an hour in front of a live audience at school. And that was my first ever interview of anyone. And I had no idea what I was doing. And it was 
uh, it was, you know, I was just very fortunate that I was able to figure my way through it. And it, nobody taught me what to do. I just did it. And part of that, you have the exact same thing going on. It's just innate curiosity. Yeah. If you don't have that curiosity, you're not going to be an interviewer, that's for sure. Um, and I think if you, if that's fascinating to you, so that to me, the people that I interview, um, you know, um, to me, they're all fascinating. They're all successful in one way, shape or form. Nobody, I don't have anybody on the show who's a would be or has never had any success in a career. I don't have those because what are they going to, what are they going to share with the audience that's useful in my specific show for Story Beat, which is about how the process of creativity. And unless you are successful, then that process is probably not well formed. Um, and so, um, and, and it's possible that it, you, it could be very well formed, but you just have had no success. I think that's doubtful. I think if you are well formed in what you're doing as a creator of some kind, then you have found success. Yeah. Be because the two go hand in hand, the success and the, the formation of that process are hand in hand. Yeah. It's hard work to become successful at anything. You, have you ever read Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Outliers? Uh, it's, I think it's just called Outliers. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's all about what does it take to become a master at anything? 10,000 hours of work. Right. Well, that's hard. That's, that's dedication. Mm -hmm. It's passion. It's energy. Um, if you don't have passion, if you don't have desire and drive uh, pr at pretty much anything, but in particular in any form of the arts, you're not likely to succeed. You're not. You, you have to be dedicated because you can't go down to the corner to the creative store and buy yourself a career. You know, it, there's only, there's no substitute for doing the work. There's just none. You have to do the work. Well, and interestingly that's enough, I will say that something that came to me by virtue of doing my show was red carpet interviews. There you go. And I have to say, you know, I loved them. Because I started to realize early on, I mean, so, like anything in life, some people just have an extremely comfortable extroverted personality. It's nothing for them to step into that one little space and a step and repeat and you know deliver something great in a few minutes and walk to the next person. But there were definitely, and I won't mention names, there were celebrities who that was not so for. And so I found it incumbent on me to create a space that was very safe, but also really conducive for them to have some kind of a flow and a connection that they would share something that was a great sound bite. And if they didn't, I found a way, oh, sometimes I would lie and say, you know what, we had a camera problem. I'm so sorry. Can we do a retake? And I would just give them a little bit of direction and a lot of love. Love is very good uh, for creating a, spa a safe space. Sure. But I found much like what you're saying, Steve, I, um, I was surprised at how easy it came to me and how much I loved it. And for me, I guess, too, if I were to be honest, you know, the glam of getting dressed up and for me also to be in the spotlight, sure. you know, have, I've had the three tenors sing to me and, you know, some other really extraordinary moments with people. Um, and just it's, it's incredible. It opens doors. So there you are on stage at Carnegie Music Hall in Pittsburgh, you're interviewing Brian Cranston, and then ta-da, he comes on your show. He well, comes on well, your podcast. Well, Brian Cranston was at Point Park, not at Carnegie Music Hall, but- uh, uh, Capiche. Right, right. Uh, yeah, so, and then he also has been on the show as well. So, uh, you know, that's just a generous human being. He also, by the way, he's a raconteur and he has great stories to tell, and that helps. What I'm sure you bumped into more than a few times on the red carpet is, folks who have been burned by interviewers or who are innately shy. They don't want to really talk about themselves. They're very good when they can memorize someone else's words and then they can say them as another character, but they themselves don't feel very confident about who they are. Those, the, the industry is filled with the, with the stars who are like that, who are a little reluctant to be interviewed. And there are stars who are never interviewed. <laughs> they just don't do them, you know? Do you have a favorite interview moment, whether it was awkward or hilarious or uh, meaningful with a celebrity, whether you were writing, directing, or you were doing your show or your Q&As? Uh, uh, 
a favorite moment that I've had in yeah. everything I've ever done. Yeah, I would say, well, it, it's not on Storybeat. I've had many favorite moments, um, including talking to Brian Cranston. That was that was one of those where it was a little bit surreal for me because he's such a huge star and such a nice person. You know, he was so easy to deal with on the show. Um, I would say the I would say the, the 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 most memorable thing for me was walking the red carpet on Broadway uh, for Jekyll and Hyde. That that was um, that was a little out of body experience. Mm. You know, um, I uh, it doesn't happen every day. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the kind of thing you dream about and you're not really sure whatever happened and there it is and um that sort of takes your breath away a little bit and then and then of course like all great things in life it's there and then it's gone and the next day you go back to just being schlumpy you you know um and at most I, that's the fascinating thing about big events and award shows and that kind of thing is that and you'll hear you'll hear stars talk about it too, where they win the Oscar, and the next day they're having to take the trash out, it, because you still have to live your life. So uh, I would say that's the 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 pinnacle for me was that particular moment. Um, I would say one other extraordinary moment. It was extraordinary, and it lasted a month. Was I got to work side by side for about six months on three plays in repertory with directed by two written by of the three by John Cassavetes. Mm, and delicious. that, and one of the shows starred Peter Falk and, and uh, his wife, Shira, one show starred Jenna Rollins and John Voigt and one show starred uh, Jenna Rollins and a very fine actor named, um, um, I want to say Michael McDonald. Um, I, but uh, I designed the lighting for all three shows in rep in a little tiny 66 seat theater in Hollywood. And I was with these people for six months, side by side with Cassavetes. And that was absolutely amazing. And was because it happened so young in my life, I was 25 years old at the time. It became a seminal event in my existence, because I learned a whole lot about working with professionals doing that because I hadn't really work and worked with a lot of professionals at that point. And after that, I worked with tons of them, but that was the first big foray. And the most amusing thing in that whole experience was Cassavetes had, he was a film guy and he had done some theater, but he was a film guy. And he and I, and I was a theater guy. I hadn't really done any film or TV at that point. It was all theater. And he and I, we're on completely different pages in the language to use. And, and I would say things and he wouldn't know what the hell I was talking about. So I'll give you a great example. There was a light, one light that was off at an angle upstage in this one little narrow part of the set of this one show. And I was talking one day about, well, we could put a gobo up in there. Well, a gobo, for those who don't know, is a pattern. So when you go to a theater and you see a, a light and it looks like leaves, uh, you know, or it looks like a building has been lit that way, those are patterns that go into the lights and they're called gobos. And I talked about gobos and that I wanted to use this one light to sculpt the way the actors look because it came in at a, an oblique side angle and it literally cast a shadow where you'd get a light dark across the face. So it was, it, it sculpted the actor. It make, made them actually look like a sculpture. And he would say to me all the time, uh, Steve, let's go up there and gobo that light. And he'd say, gobo that light. And I, I finally got frustrated one day and I said, John, I'm trying to use that as a sculpting the actor. It's not a gobo. And he actually turned to me and he put his hand on his hip and he said, Steve, please don't be artsy fartsy. 
I have never, ever forgotten that. Steve, please don't be artsy fartsy. That was like, <laughs> because we were not on the same page with the language. And so, he was using the word as a verb. You're going to go go something. That, correct. He was so using it as a verb, down. but it's not. And, <laughs> and he, he, it was just a marvelous, marvelous experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, working with those personalities and, uh, the differences between the way that Peter Falk and Jenna Rollins and John Voigt, three Master massive class. stars, uh, the, the way that they each, all three of them approached how they got to the stage differently, how they got to the character totally differently. It was fascinating to watch mm -hmm. and much, and a lot of fun. And, uh, we're at the end here, and I do want to fit in these two really brief questions. So if you sure. can give me brief answers, because I'm fascinated. Your bio said, Steve, you're also an artist. What kind of artist are you? So if you go to stevecuden.com, you can go and search in the pull downs. Um, Steve's art, or it's a Steve's art or something like that. I can't remember what the exact thing says, but it'll, it's art. And I have been taking photographs for years and years and years and years. And I take those photographs and I put them into Photoshop and I turn them into paintings. Mm. And there's lots of them that you can see on stevecuden.com. So that's the kind of art that I do. And recently um, I have found I've had a lot of fun taking those paintings, those photo paintings, um, and I, I actually have them printed on canvas and they look like paintings. So it's really great. Multi-talented. Well, this is Dare to Dream. I know you've already alluded to the fact that you can't tell me about the projects you're working on or you'll have to kill me. So since I very much want to breathe to live to see tomorrow, what do you next dare to dream? How can you describe what's next for you in your heart or you'd like to create in your life? My goal is to get back to Broadway. Mm -hmm. My goal is I'm also writing a, a feature and I'm in the middle of figuring out a novel. And my goal is to have all three. That's uh, get back to Broadway, have get a feature film produced and produce at least one or more novels. That's, that's, that's my dream right now is to... Um, because the, the teaching took me a little bit off the creative world. I'm still doing it, but at a lot smaller pace, slower pace. Um, and now I'm ramping that back up again. So that that's my that's my dream. Wow. So this is your second time in the show. You, you so deliver. This is such a cool conversation. I really well, you make it easy, Debbie. Mm. So when you get these three new projects running, even if it's not concurrent, but we have to have you back mm. to have the next, you know, phase of your life conversation. Uh, I look forward to it already. And, you know, thank you, Steve. Well, thank you, Debbie. Uh, love to be back and always love chatting with you always. Yeah. So go check out more about him, stevecuden.com, his books. Both of them are available on Amazon. The one we talked about today is Beating Broadway. And I end the show with this quote from the musical Wicked. I'm through accepting limits because someone says they're so. Some things I cannot change, but till I try, I'll never know. Yeah. <laughs> subscribe to the dare to dream podcast to hear this weekly number one transformation conversation thank you so much for all you post down below i read all of them i get back to you as i can and do subscribe and tell your friends and family about this show send it to them my guest next week is pax the divine wisdom source out in the world through the writings of author penelope Jean Hayes, and channeler Carol Serene Borgens. Carol has been channeling the spirit energy packs since the early 1990s, and the purpose of this connection was to channel PAX wisdom and put it into book form so messages could be shared with the world. It's pretty profound information for right now. So definitely tune in. And remember, don't just dare to dream, dare to turn all your dreams into your reality. And if you're listening to the podcast and you'd like to see me, Debbie Dashinger, and my guest, go to YouTube and join the videos there, youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. <laughs>